you got a Bible, you would go with Matthew 7. That's where we're going to start off today. But I want to tell you a quick story as you're getting there. Matthew 7. We're going to go and uh, be in there today. If you, have, if you need a Bible, we've got Bibles over there. You're welcome to take them home. You don't have to ask permission. Just take them. You're not stealing. They're free. Um, so that'll get off your conscience. Nobody likes to steal a Bible, but if, you know, whatever. Um, Matthew 7. I'd like to open up our talk today about a story that I heard a long time ago, and it was sort of funny, but uh, I, I think it has a little bit to do with what we're going to talk about today. It was a story about a lady who, at Christmas, she, uh, she was cooking for her, her grandmother, her great-great-grandmother. And so there were three generations of people in the house, and, and she decided to have Christmas d- dinner at her place, and that she was going to do the cooking, and that she would cook her meal just like her mom uh, cooked for her, and like her grandmom cooked for her mom. And so she, she's getting ready, and she's prepped, she's excited about this. She takes the Christmas ham, right? How many of you do Christmas ham? Do you do Christmas ham, right? I just do Christmas chocolates. I'm down with chocolate. I like Christmas treats. Uh, I, you know, ham's great, but uh, something about magic cookie bars just sound really a lot better than ham. Um, so she takes the ham out, and she sits it on the counter, and as she's sitting there, her little baby girl comes up to her and says, Mom, what are you doing? And she goes, well, I'm preparing the ham to cook just like my mom and your great-grandmother did for you. And as she puts the ham on the counter, she takes out a knife, and she chops off both sides of the ham. And her, her daughter says, Mom, why do you cut off both sides of the ham? And she goes, well, my mom did that when she cooked it, and, and her mom did that when she cooked it. And she goes, but Mom, why do you cut off both sides of the ham? And she goes, I guess I really don't know. <laughs> I guess I've always done it that way because I saw my mom do that, and I saw her mom do that, and I just... That's how I grew up, so that's what I did. Well, then her, her mom comes to the house, and she goes, Hey, Mom, I got a quick question for you. Uh, your, your granddaughter just asked, why, why, do we, why do we cut the ends off the ham? And she goes, Well, what are you talking about? Well, you know, every Christmas, you take the ham out, and you cut the ends off of it. And she goes, Well, my mom always did that. And she goes, Okay, yeah, I get that. That's what I do. But why do we do that? She goes, You know, I really don't know. I don't know why we do that. So then Grandma rolls in. And grandma comes into the kitchen. She's so excited. She's got three generations of girls sitting at the counter, and they're all preparing. And she goes over to her her grandma and says, Hey, grandma, why why do we cut the ends off the ham? And she goes, Well, what are you talking about? Cut the ends off the ham. Why would you do that? And finally, her mom pipes up and goes, Mom, you cut the ends off the ham. I remember you doing that. We did it for years. And she goes, Oh, It's because we never had a pan big enough to fit the whole ham in. (laughs) I find it interesting that often we do things because our parents did them, right? How many many of you know for sure that you have little idioms and little mannerisms that your mom or your dad or your grandma have, right? Yeah, some of us don't want to raise our hands very high because sometimes they're not really great things to brag about. But I, I guarantee you, you have some kind of trait, some kind of likeness of the people who conceived you and bore you, if that's the right word, bore. I'm not going to go there. I think it's interesting that God genetically designed human life to pass on traits from one generation to another. Isn't that interesting? From one generation to another, God engineered humanity so that we would have some kind of trait, some kind of symbolism, some kind of signal or likeness of those that we came from. I would say likewise, we are created, Genesis 126, God says, let us create man in our own, own image and after our own likeness. I would say likewise, we too bear some traits of our creator, of the God who created us. One trait in particular, and I want to hit on this today, one trait in particular is the longing for companionship. The longing for companionship. Whether that's a relationship with, a, with, with, a, with, a, with a, a, an individual or solely what I'm talking about is a relationship with God. Because I truly believe that even in the hearts of the most hated person that there is a longing for a relationship with God. I believe there's a hole in all of our lives that can only be filled through a relationship with our Creator. And before we read our text that we're going to read into, I I need you to do a little exercise for me. Not physical exercise, but just an exercise. I need you to set your mindset to that of a two-year-old. Now, some of us, that's really easy. For me, it's a piece of cake. I'm there. Done. I need you to set your mindset to a two-year, because I think so many times what we do is we read the Scripture too intellectually, and we, we take out of it 
some of its rich intentness. And so for the remainder of this message, I want you to set your mind as a two-year-old. Think about that for a moment. A two-year-old can speak most times or grunt, (laughs) but they're very limited in their vocabulary, aren't they? Am I right? Can two-year-olds speak? Okay. Okay. I was thinking about that with my own kids. I'm like, they spoke, but not very well. Two years, you know, they, they can speak, but they can, they're very limited in their vocabulary. They're really limited in their ability, aren't they? They can do very little for themselves. Common realities are still foggy to them. In other words, they still believe they can fly, right? How many of you remember this? Standing on the edge of the bed with your cape. Ladies, don't look at me like you never wore a cape. Some of y'all wore a cape, right? And you're just like, I can fly, right? I can fly. And if you had siblings that didn't like you, yes, you can fly. Matter of fact, you'll never fly at that height. You need to get up higher. Common realities were still foggy. We could still believe we could fly as long as we had that cape on. We still believed in superpowers, right? Also, that we had total assurance of our parents' capabilities, strengths, and knowledge to perform anything. Think about that. When you're at that age, there's nothing mom and dad can't do, right? Or grandma or grandpa or auntie or uncle. They can do anything. They can do anything. Are you there? Here we go. Matthew 7. Jesus is talking. He says, ask. We're starting in 7, 7. So Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, everybody say more, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Keep yourself in that mindset. I truly believe that God wants our relationships more than he wants our request. That winning our hearts is often harder than fulfilling our request that we bring to him. I think so many times we come to God and instead of when in the mode and the, in, in the mindset of building a relationship with God, we come to God much like we go to Walmart. There's a list. There's things to get. And I would tell you that there's three things I just want to pull out of this text that are super simple. And I, I want to keep it this way because I would, I would suggest that often, again, we... we, we use too much intellect sometimes and I think we destroy the simplicity of the gospel. I think we destroy the simplicity of the word of God. Understand that when we come to God that we should come to him out of a need of a relationship first. Because again, we all have that longing for companionship with him. I would suggest that everyone in this room somewhere down the line you've said these words, I wish I knew God. I wish I could talk to God. I wish I could feel God. I wish I could hear God. I wish I could experience God. I wish I could see God. And I would tell you that if we can keep this in mind, that the first thing that God wants from us is a relationship, then I would would say that everything else, everything else is child's play to him. Because really, is God limited in his ability and his strength? Absolutely not. Is God limited in his resources and his knowledge? Absolutely not. But what seems to be the hardest thing for God to capture is the human heart. So three things I would tell you. Number one is this. As your father is persistent, be persistent. See, the, the text says ask, right? It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open." The text, in the original language, if you were to put the word, this one word will change the whole intent of this text. Can you put that first verse up for me? Check this out. Look at this verse, this first verse. And in front of ask and in front of seek and in front of knock, put the word keep on. Do you see how that changes the intent of this text? Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Ask, seek, and knock. Just a little bit of talking about not trying to intellectually decipher the scriptures. Ask, seek, and knock are all set in the present tense. 
In other words, they're happening right now. Boom, boom, boom. When Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be open, it would be better translated in the original language to keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. I find that often, sometimes, we're not as persistent as we should be. Think about a, think about a two-year-old. Mom, 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 mom. And that's usually what happened. Dad is sitting right there. And it's... <laughs> Often we give up too soon and we forget that God never gives up on his people. So I believe as a trait in us, birth in us, created in us, that we should have a persistent faith. Just because you don't have the answer yet, don't stop asking. Don't stop asking. See, I believe that persistent persistence feeds our faith. I believe the more that we ask, the more that we get in this rhythm of going, but Father, but Father, but God, God, I, God, God, it feeds our faith. Because how, would, how, how many of you would agree that it takes faith to pray? It takes faith to worship. It takes faith to believe, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Or is that just super easy? No, we would all agree that it takes a lot of faith. And I think one of the things that helps us feed that faith is, is almost an annoying persistence in our pursuit of Jesus. I would say the second thing is this, is seek your father like he sought after you. Seek your father like he sought after you. You know what's great about the gospel is this the relentless pursuit of humanity by God the creator, God the father. It's a relentless pursuit that has no end. It's a relentless pursuit that doesn't uh, wane with weather or with culture or with time. It's a, it's a relentless pursuit that even we, the, the ones being pursued, cannot hinder in a sense that God will always run after his kids. He will always run after you. What if we pursued him like he pursues us? What if we sought after the Father like the Father seeks after us? Think about that. Is there ever a time that God sleeps? Is there ever a time that God kicks back and sends your prayers to voicemail? Is there ever a time where God sits back and, and puts up the closed sign on the doors of his office? He never does. He never will. He never has. There's nothing in Scripture that would even suggest that He is a God that grows the least bit weary or fatigued of changing or chasing after His people. Time after time after time, we see God giving chance after chance after chance. We see God pursuing more and more and more His creation because He loves what He has created. He loves the people that bear His image, that have His traits that look like him. One of the first questions God asks is in Genesis 3.9. And it's when God is looking for Adam. Adam and Eve, they fall. They eat the thing they shouldn't have eaten. And they hide, much like we do when we do something bad, right? Remember, two-year-old, right? I was, not, I was not the kid who came to grips with what I did wrong. My kids do that really well, and I'm always shocked. I'm like, I'm always like, hold on. <laughs> what else happened? You know, because like you're coming too clean too fast. But I was the kid who always, always, always hid. Always hid. I was a brother. I'm a brother. Well, I am still a brother of four. And one of the funniest things we, we told my mom years ago is she was moving from the house that we grew up to to the house that she's in now. She picked up one of her favorite pieces of furniture and the back piece of wood fell off as she picked it up. And she just was like, oh, I can't believe that broke. And, oh. and so we were at her new house and we were over there and we're talking. And she's like, oh, I moved this beautiful piece of furniture and this little thing broke. I was so disappointed. And I went, oh, has, did it just break or did it break a long time? She goes, no, it just broke like a couple of months ago. And, and I went, you want to hear a funny story? <laughs> now, granted, I would have not told this story had I been the individual who did it. I said, you want to hear fun? My oldest brother, the one, and if he's watching, you know I'm right. My oldest brother, the one who says he raised us, if you have older siblings, they feel like they raise you. 
They do not. <laughs> my mom and dad went to a Rolling Stones concert. And uh, my oldest brother was watching us. And as we were annoying the crap out of him, he threw a pillow at me and I ducked like a ninja. <laughs> and as I ducked, it flew over my head and it hit the furniture and knocked the piece of wood off. And at that moment, I felt like God shined down as I saw fear for the first time rise up in my oldest brother's eyes. And I looked at him, and like every child that sees this, you say these words with such confidence and such just strength. Ooh! Right? Right? And everything victorious goes through your mind. Dad's going to kill you. And I'm going to have front row seats. It's going to be awesome. I'm not going to say anything nice at your funeral. Not one thing. And like older brothers do, he threatened the life of me and my firstborn and told me that if I said anything, that if I said anything, he would just... I got to rat him out. 20 years later. All that to say this, is I think so many times when we, when we fail in life, I think we feel like God is like the younger brother. Ooh. When really he is just asking where we are. As he did Adam. Adam, where are you? He says, I was hiding. He said, why? I would tell you, seek after God. Pray, cry out to him. When you fall short or when you feel like life isn't going your way, don't hide from him, run to him. He's a good father. I understand that some of us in this room probably did not grow up with great dads or great moms. But let me tell you something, please don't project that onto our Heavenly Father. That's not who He is. I think it's really, I think it's a bad deal that a lot of us probably didn't grow up in that, in that home. But please, please, when you talk about Jesus, when you talk about the Scriptures, that's not who He is. The last thing I would say is just simply this, knock, knock, and knock. Knock, like a persistent child at the front door, waiting to come in. Knock. Think about how a child will continually just... How many of you trick-or-treated when you were a kid? There was one thing I never put up with. And that was going to a house and not leaving without candy. I didn't put up with that. I figured the whole world knew it was Halloween. Like, I deserve... You should be on the ball. This is a national, global holiday. And you should be on the ball and you should be having candy. So when I come to your house, don't, I will not leave unless you give me something. And I remember my dad leaving me and my little brother out and just sitting at a house, no lights on. And I'm just sitting there. Doom, 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 doom. And my dad's like, I don't think they're home. I'm like, oh, it's Halloween. No, 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 no. And I would just sit there. Doom, 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 doom. I remember just being so persistent, like, there's got to be a Snickers bar in there. Doom, 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 doom. And I'll tell you, there are times where Elderly people would come to the door, you know, in their pajamas. I'm like, it's six in the afternoon. And then I, getting older, I realized that, yeah, that can be a, probably a good time to take a nap. That doesn't sound so bad. But what would happen, what would happen if we approached God like that? What would happen is if we just kept knocking on those doors that we believe he's opened? What would happen if we were just persistent like a child and just kept knocking and just kept pursuing and just kept asking? I'd like to conclude with a story that Jesus told. And I think it's important that, I, that you hear that Jesus told this story. Uh, it wasn't a Pharisee. It wasn't just a, somebody who was following him. But Jesus himself told this story. And the reason he told this story, it says right at the first, Luke 18, 1 through 8. It says, and he told this parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and never lose heart. Have you ever lost heart? Have you ever been disappointed? Have you prayed and prayed and prayed and asked and asked and asked and knocked and knocked and knocked and yet nothing changed? Jesus tells this story so that it would help us not to lose heart. And here he goes. In verse 2, 18, verse 2, he says this. In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. He was an evil judge. He was a reckless judge. He didn't care about people, and he didn't care about God. In verse 3, he says, And there was a widow 
in that city who kept coming to him saying, give me justice over my adversaries. For a while he refused. But afterwards he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continually coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. In other words, Jesus says, listen to what the character in the story, the one who neither fears God nor fears man. Listen to what he says. Because this woman just keeps coming to me and coming to me and coming to me, beating on my door, asking the same question, persistently knocking, I'm just going to give her what she wants. He says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? In other words, Jesus is saying, I, well, let me back up and just sort of put a disclaimer out there. Like a good father, God isn't going to give you something that will destroy you or that is not good for you. As much as I love candy, my parents still didn't let me keep all my candy I got at Halloween. And I wasn't, I, wasn't of the, I wasn't of the culture where you had nice Halloween buckets. We had garbage bags. That's how we went trick-or-treating. We just went garbage bags. But my parents had to sift through it, number one. They, we lived in a neighborhood where you'd have drugs or you'd have needles and inappropriate things in there. And my parents would sift through that. But one thing my parents would always do is they would, um, they would collect <laughs> a certain portion. I thought it maybe for gas money. I don't know. But they would collect a certain portion of, of our winnings and they would hold it to themselves. And, and, and at first I was like, that's not fair. I was the one who walked up and knocked on that door 37 times. I'm the one who, who's got makeup on that looks like Superman. I'm the one hauling the trash bag around. I'm the one who's doing all the work. Dad, you're not doing anything, anything. Like, I did all the work. I, I just, come on, I earned this. Shouldn't I have this? This is what I want. Give me what I want. This is mine. Yeah, then, well, then I learned about cavities. Um, and then here's the deal. Check this out. My dad did that, not because he didn't love me, because he cared enough about me, he didn't want me getting sick. He cared enough about my hygiene that he didn't want my teeth rotting out. He cared enough about me to do what he thought was best. And just like that, here's the deal. We can't come into a set mindset that I can twist God's arm to make him do whatever I want him to do. You can't. He's God. If we could twist his arm and make him do whatever we want to do, he would not be God. He would be weak. Correct? Right? My wife can make me do a lot of things. Seriously. She has to do a couple of things. And then I'll just, whatever. And I'm just like, I'm so weak. She looks at me. She smiles at me. Whatever. And then I'm like, fine, I'll do it. I'm just weak, man. I'm so weak. God's not like that. God is strong and he's loving. And we have to understand that sometimes the things that we want don't line up with his will. And sometimes the things that we want aren't the best things for us. And it's tough to be able to trust God that he knows what's best for us. But I think the story that, he, that Jesus tells is very much applicable to being persistent. I would say, I wouldn't stop asking, seeking, and knocking until you knew for sure that that wasn't God's will for you. Why give up? Why quit? There are things that I'm still asking and seeking and knocking for. And there's things that I've stopped because I understand that God's saying, no, or not right now, or that's not best for you. I'll conclude with this. I would say, don't let your but when overshadow his I will. Because this is what happens, is that the but when is usually the phrase we say when we believe that God is, is moving in that direction. And the best way to explain it is if you look back to Matthew 7, if you look at 7 through 11, you see the words will in there tons of times. Ask and it will, not that it might. A will is pretty definite, right? Like if you ask somebody to dinner and they say, I will be there, aren't you sort of banking that they're going to be there? 
Guys, if you ask a girl out on a date and she goes, I will come on a date with you, don't you pretty much like, you bank on that, right? I do. I mean, with my wife. <laughs> Clarify that. But he says, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be, it will be open. Isn't it interesting that all the I wills in there, God doesn't leave any room for you to just think that it might not happen for you. But this is the problem is when we pray and we read this scripture and we exercise our faith, the biggest question that comes up is, but when? When? When will it happen? When will my business flourish? When will my parents get saved? When will my wife come back? When will my husband? When will? When? And we have to understand that sometimes that question can overshadow God's faithfulness in telling you, I will. So don't let your but when overshadow his I will. Sometimes I have to step back and go, you know what? It's not, it's not, my, it's not my issue to find out when it's going to happen. I just got to believe that it's God's will and it will eventually. 